Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman here in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Paris Schutz reporting live from Devon Avenue on the city's north side. On the show tonight, how well are officials handling COVID-19 in jails and prisons? Efforts to keep grocery stores to keep their, their shelves stocked. How Chicago's transit network is adapting to the pandemic. And checking in with local universities as they give remote learning the old college try. But first, a quick note about tonight's program. Due to the coronavirus, we've had to make some changes. Brandis, as you can see, will be in the studio all week along with Carol and Phil. I will not be going into the studio all week, but I will be in a different city neighborhood talking to residents and businesses about the impact of the coronavirus. And right now we're on Devon Avenue. We'll have more in just a few minutes. But first, Brandis, back to you with some of the latest developments from today. Paris, we'll see you in a minute. The governor and health officials reported 250 new cases and four more deaths in Illinois today. That makes a statewide total of 1,535 reported cases and 16 deaths. We've had a larger outbreak, as many of you know, in Cook County and Chicago than in other areas of the state. But it is coming to every county. It's been now, I think we're in 26 counties, I think, so far. Are we at 30? Sorry. 31 counties. We have 102 counties. Just, you know, two weeks ago or so, this was only in one or two counties. Um, it is everywhere. No one is immune from this, and that's why it's so important to me that we protect people all across the state and that people abide by this stay at home and make sure that they're doing right by their neighbors and their friends. Meanwhile, stocks surged today in anticipation of a deal for a stimulus bill in Congress. The Dow Jones Industrial Average notched its best day since 1933, closing up 11 percent, more than 2,000 points. The S&P 500 had its biggest daily gain since 2008, with shares of industries that have been hard hit by the coronavirus shutdown, such as airlines, casinos and cruise lines, soaring as much as 40 percent. President Donald Trump says he wants to reopen at least part of the country by Easter. Ultimately, the goal is to ease the guidelines and open things up to very large sections of our country as we near the end of our historic battle with the invisible enemy. we are going for a while, but we win. We win. I said earlier today that I hope we can do this by Easter. I think that would be a great thing for our country, and we're all working very hard to make that a reality. And Easter is Sunday, April 12th, 19 days from now. Some health officials are calling that target date far too aggressive. The Chicago Police Department's interim superintendent reports that six police officers have tested positive for COVID-19 with two hospitalized. In addition to that, five Chicago firefighters have tested positive. Interim Police Chief Charlie Beck also says that officers' calls are down. Since the, uh, declar the public health declarations, we have issued zero citations and zero arrests for violation of the health orders. We've also seen significant evidence that Chicago is staying home. Uh, our uh, calls for service, uh, radio calls, 911 calls are down 30 uh, percent during this month. We've also seen a significant reduction in vehicle stops and pedestrian stops by our police officers. All of this indicates to me that people are, are doing what we ask, that they are that they are staying home. And the police department adds that more than 12,000 infection control and protective gear kits that includes masks, gloves and hand sanitizer have been distributed to officers across the city. They were assembled by recruits whose training has been suspended because of the pandemic. Some relief for area transit riders. The CTA is offering a one time refund for unused days on both the seven and 30 day passes that are active. Riders on the South Shore line can use their monthly March pass for the month of April. And doctors, nurses, paramedics and other medical personnel on the front lines of the coronavirus crisis will now be able to ride free on Metro trains for the duration of Illinois stay at home order. We'll have more on the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on area transit later on in the show. And now we go back to Paris Shuts on Devon Avenue in the city's West Ridge neighborhood on the north side with a view on the ground of the coronavirus's impact on that diverse community, Paris. 
That's right, Brandis. We're on Devon Avenue, one of the most diverse neighborhoods anywhere in the country. As many know, a huge concentration of Indians, Pakistanis, Orthodox Jew, Syrians, lots of immigrants, lots of refugees here. And the lifeblood on Devon is small businesses, mom and pop shops, markets, bakeries, clothing shops, things like that. And as with many neighborhoods around the cities, most of those shops are closed. Some restaurants are still open for delivery and takeout. Now, there is a high concentration of medical supply stores here on Devon Avenue. So we stopped into one called All American Medical Supply. The owner there, Dr. Nikki Patel, told us that she has frantically ordered and stocked and restocked masks and gloves and ventilators by the thousands. She ran out of her last mask yesterday. She says because of demand, she won't be getting any more in. We were having nursing homes come in. Um, parents of social workers were coming in because their facilities didn't have cleaning supplies. And we limited the surgical mask one per customer um, to prevent hoarding, to make sure that we had enough to go around in our community to the grocery stores, you know, to the pharmacies that are going to be open as the essential businesses stay open and they don't have enough. And we service a very non-affluent population and those people are working downtown you know, and they're still being exposed to the virus. They come home to their immigrant family and they have an elderly person in the home and they don't have masks. Now, she does say that beyond this, her normal business is just about ceased. Patients are no longer coming in for things like canes and walkers and other devices for physical rehabilitation that she normally sells. She says that people are staying home, especially older folks, instead of going to their doctor's appointments and that means a slowdown for her business. I have bills to pay and with seniors and people staying home, you're not going out for your regular appointments, you're not going to the hospital for your scheduled surgery, you're not seeing your doctor for, you know, just regular blood pressure medication or maintenance. They're not going to get equipment and supplies. I'm seriously going to feel that in the next 60 to 90 days. And these are concerns echoed by small businesses all across the city. Now, the mayor and city treasurer, Melissa Conyers Irvin, have unveiled a $100 million small business loan fund. So that means businesses that employ 50 people or less, they can get up to $50,000. Conyers Irvin says they're still working out some of the details, but she expects that the terms will include 0% interest for the first six months. And eligible businesses have to show that the coronavirus shutdown has cost them at least 25 percent of their normal income. Now, we also spoke with Devon Community Bank, a local institution that lends to a lot of these businesses here. They say that on a case-by-case -case basis, they have looked at restructuring some terms of some of their lending products, like some businesses will pay interest only for the foreseeable future instead of interest and principal. And there are other businesses that have stayed open and done fairly well in certain parts of this shutdown. Grocery stores, obviously, because they're essential businesses. We stopped by the Patel Brothers grocery store, and the owner there said that business really surged on Saturday before the shutdown, but since it has been down 50%. People are worried, people are fearful. Some of our employees are not coming for work because of this uh, flu. All right, so we're in the West Ridge area. There's a West Ridge Chamber of Commerce. They're going to have a meeting tomorrow night with business owners to discuss ways to survive this coronavirus shutdown. And we mentioned that there is a high concentration of immigrants and refugees in this community. So I'll be back later in the program with the impact on those communities. And now, Brandis, back to you. Paris, thanks. We'll see you in a bit. And now to Phil Ponce and Cook County Jail's response to the coronavirus pandemic. Phil. Brandis, jails and prisons are especially vulnerable during the COVID-19 pandemic. People are living in tight quarters, health care may not be as accessible as necessary, and basic needs like soap might not be in everyone's hands. This week, there have been confirmed cases of the coronavirus reported at Cook County Jail. At this point, some advocates see the situation as a ticking time bomb and are calling for some detainees, like the elderly and nonviolent offenders, to be released from jail or prison. Joining us with more on what precautions advocates would like to see officials take are Cook County Public Defender Amy Campanelli, who joins us from her office in downtown Chicago,
Joby Cates, executive director of Restore Justice, has a civic group advocating for changes to Illinois' criminal justice system. She joins us from Evanston. And Nika Jones Tapia, she's a former warden at Cook County Jail, who is now with Chicago Beyond. That's a group addressing youth equity, and she joins us now from there. We also reached out to Cook County Sheriff's Office and the Illinois Department of Corrections, who both said they were unable to join us tonight. Uh, first of all, according to our research, there are about uh, 5,600 inmates at Cook County Jail and roughly 40,000 prisoners in the Illinois state prison system. Joby Cates, what are you hearing in terms of how many uh, prisoners and staff in, have been infected? We know that two Cook County detainees uh, have tested positive and one Cook County, uh, one Cook County uh, um, sheriff's deputy. Uh, do, do you know of any other cases besides those three? No, we do not. Um, in fact, we just saw that today the Illinois Department of Corrections is saying that they've administered zero tests and have zero confirmed cases. We do know that several facilities have had quarantines and lockdowns for the past couple of weeks, but since we know they're not testing, we don't know if those lockdowns or quarantines are uh, flu related or related to this particular virus. Nika Jones Tapia, would you say that uh, it's likely that given uh, given the proximity and the, and the circumstances under which prisoners are held, that there uh, are likely more cases of uh, coronavirus? Yes, the similar, you know, circumstance that we see in the community, people can be asymptomatic and given the close quarters, we don't know how many people, um, the men and women living there, as well as the staff, have been infected with the virus, and we won't know, frankly, until they begin to show symptoms and are tested. So yes, the likelihood is high that the virus has spread um, throughout the men and women living there, as well as um, amongst the staff. Amy Campanelli, uh, one thinks of, uh, from what is known about the coronavirus, the uh, older people are particularly vulnerable, apparently. Uh, what do you know about statistics as to the percentage of older prisoners in uh, not only in the Cook County Jail, but uh, across the system in the state? Well, what I know is at the Cook County Jail, there's about 20% of those who are detained at the Cook County Jail are age 45 and older. It's about 7.5% are age 55 and over. We get a daily count of the Cook County Jail, the population, the type of population that's in there every day from the sheriff. I don't know across the state, but I do know that many of the people in the jail, no matter what age you are, come into the jail with medical issues, other health issues. There are sicknesses that go out through the jail, like Dr. Jones was talking about, regular flu, other problems in the jail. So they're, they're already at risk. Nika Jones Tapia, it may be obvious, but uh, just expand uh, expand for us, please, what the, what the conditions are that can promote transmission of the virus in prison or in jail. Yes, well, you mentioned the close living quarters. That's one. But also, if the men and women living there don't have access to hygiene supplies, soap, hand sanitizer, which we know is oftentimes considered contraband in correctional institutions. Um, if they don't have access to increased laundering services, then that puts them at increased risk. And then not to mention, there are three shifts of staff going in and out of the jail every day. And so they're going to communities there, engage with other people, and that is the likelihood of spread, not just within the jail, but in the community as well. And so that's why there should be a particular focus on what we could do differently in correctional systems to prevent the spread, because it will impact the community at large. Joby Kate, so what can be done differently to prevent the spread or minimize it? Well, first of all, very similar things that we can do here can be done there if there's will to do it. And the single most important thing our systems can do is release as many people as possible so they can practice social distancing on their own. They cannot do that in prison. Um, in Illinois prisons, we're far, far over capacity for what the facilities were built for. We don't have space for inmates to stay away from each other. We're having overcrowding now in one wing of a prison as another wing is empty to make space for quarantine, which creates even worse hygiene, hygiene system, uh, situations in the, the wing where the people had to get pushed to create the new space. Um, lots of transfers and mobility in the system. So in addition to releasing 
um, a significant number of people, not a trickle, not 100 or 200. I'm talking about a couple of thousand people system-wide at a minimum, swiftly, um, and making sure that those who remain have exactly what Mika uh, suggested, as well as swift access to doctors and 24 access, four hour access to doctors, which no one in the prison system now has. Amy Campanelli, uh, if uh, the system, either in prisons or in the jail, is going to release inmates, which inmates should be released? Which should be kept? Well, you know, I filed a petition in court, and um, I'm so happy that Judge Martin agreed with me at the categories of people that I think should be looked at immediately to be released. And there's the pregnant women. There's, of course, anyone who is suffering from a issue, a medical issue, and is over the age of 60. Those who are bailable should be released. A judge has already determined that if they had money and they could post that money, they should be released. So we should not consider the money ash aspect and release them immediately. Anybody on a misdemeanor charge, anybody who's serving a sentence already, like a county jail sentence for 30 days, we should release them now. They should not be put at risk by remaining in the jail. And other nonviolent felonies, class three and four felonies. Nika Jones Tapia, uh, as far as uh, as far as uh, releasing prisoners, are are you on board that uh, uh, with the notion that a significant, not a trickle, but a significant number of prisoners should be released uh, under the circumstances? Yes, um, even outside of these circumstances, a large number <laughs> of men and women who are incarcerated should not be. Um, and now that we know that we're dealing with this public health crisis, now is the time for swift and bold action. And I just wanna take the time to thank Public Defender Amy Campanelli, State's Attorney Kim Fox, mm -hmm. Sheriff Tom Dart, because we are seeing them make those swift and bold decisions. They've already started releasing some people, but we do need masses released. And so to see that the public defender is going into court this week, we're hoping that the judges will agree with many of the individuals that, that the public defender's office is bringing forth, because we don't want to continue to spread the virus throughout the corruption Correctional systems. We know that it's already there. And so the best thing that we can do right now is to consider prevention for as many people as possible. And that means getting them out of the correctional institutions. We are almost out of time. But Joby Cates, very quickly, uh, what are the next steps? Well, um, I, I believe you've heard from two folks who are working really closely with officials at the county level. Illinois has 101 other counties. Um, Cook County is not the only county in the state. It's not the only county that will be impacted. So counties that are not yet where Cook County is need to start preparing, and they need to also take swift action. Most importantly, the 38,000 people who are in the Department of Corrections are not all violent offenders. Even people with violent offenses on their ticket may be people who've never thrown a punch. So I'd really encourage uh, Governor Pritzker and officials at the state level and the Department of Corrections to use the tools already at their fingertips currently within legal frameworks to let out a dramatically larger number of people. And that's where I'll have to leave it. Many thanks to Amy Campanelli, Joby Cates, and Nika Jones-Tapia. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And up next, Brandis is back with Amanda Vinicky to talk about new ways doctors are seeing patients. But first, a look at the weather. <laughs> One of the ways that the coronavirus is changing medicine, increasingly patients are visiting their doctors online rather than in person. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Venicky joins us now via video conference to tell us what's behind the uptick and how telemedicine works. Amanda. Brandis, telemedicine has been around for years at places like Rush University Hospital. And while once upon a time it might have been thought of as something mostly for use by rural resident, rural residents, that is, people who live far from a doctor or hospital, they're certainly not the only ones other people can and do use it. At Rush, it can make life easier for a patient who has a hard time getting around, like someone with Parkinson's but you can be right here in Chicago and the logistics to get from your home to a provider who's not even maybe physically that far from you can be mountainous. Uh, so telemedicine is, can really bridge that gap for some people. 
sometimes it's a matter of convenience. You have a busy day at work or you're on vacation. And it can work in a lot of different ways. Say you're a patient with a very common ailment like a cold or red eyes. You could fill out a questionnaire and then get a response written back to you from a doctor. Other times it may necessitate a video visit. Dr. Perry says in those cases, most of the time patients use just an app on their smartphone. He says these days though, the majority of patients who are video conferencing with rush doctors are doing so out of coronavirus concerns. Last month in February, he says, rush had about 60 patients who video conferenced with their doctors. This month, so far, 1,100, the vast majority of them, again, with COVID concerns. It's really remarkable. You can see the anxiety that exists in people, right? In the general public around this topic. And you can see literally like good information causing somebody to be able to wind down and actually feel like they have more understanding of what's going on with them, with their loved ones that they're concerned about. And you can really see people just sort of de-escalate as you're talking to them. So Amanda, what does a telehealth visit cost? So an asynchronous visit, that's that questionnaire method that I mentioned, that will run $30. A video visit will cost you about 49 bucks, and that is without or regardless of insurance. Regardless of insurance, that's right. And a patient could say, yep, the convenience that you're getting is more than, uh, more than enough for me to say that's really well worth it. So we have patients who pay us $30 for an asynchronous visit. Our average turnaround time on those visits is 20 minutes. So by the time the patient gives us their information, they literally have an answer back in their inbox on average in 20 minutes, uh, and our patients love it. But for those with coronavirus concerns, it is free. Those costs are wiped away. Literally, there's no cost. Rush sees this as a public service for those who don't have insurance. Now, if you do, regardless of your policy, also going to be covered. That's due to an executive order signed last week by Governor J.B. Pritzker. This order will allow more providers to get reimbursed for these services and allow patients more flexibility and safety in getting the medical guidance and care that they need. That executive order, by the way, also covers patients with Medicaid. President Donald Trump issuing exec a similar executive action last week. Dr. Perry says, particularly with coronavirus, this is a great way to see a doctor. And that is whether you have those flu-like symptoms or whether you have anything else that's non-emergency but requires or you want to see a doctor. You know, it protects patients, it protects family members who might be driving them in to see us in person. It protects our providers on our end as well. It really is a beautiful way to minimize risk of transmission in the environment. And so much of what's been going on in the environment is all about trying to minimize risk of transmission of this illness. So how similar to a regular doctor's visit is this, Amanda? Now, Vernis, rather than tell you about it, I'm going to show you. I had a sort of trial visit with Dr. Perry this afternoon, and uh, I need to be sure to say this because I know my mom and dad are watching. <laughs> Don't worry, this was pretend. I'm feeling okay, I have no cold. Thank you for connecting with Rush On Demand. Tell me what's going on with you today. I have had a bit of a cold, sniffly nose, and there's a tickle in my throat. Gotcha. Well, I'm glad you connected with us. There's so much concern about coronavirus out in the community. Tell me, has there been any- He went on to ask questions like whether I had been around anybody who is ill, if I had a cough or a fever. Those are two of the main symptoms that doctors are looking for as potential indicators of having COVID-19. I asked him whether there is any danger of a doctor missing out on really important cues that they would otherwise pick up on in a traditional visit when they saw a patient in the flesh. And Dr. Perry acknowledged that this is not for everything. It is not for everyone. But he says that particularly at this point in time, during a pandemic, when you have a virus that is so very contagious, that this is a really good option. And he says that he hopes that even after the crisis, more people and especially more politicians, remember that, did want to also add that that executive order the governor signed last week does something else too. It gives people who'd recently moved to Illinois or who are retired in the past couple of years as doctors or nurses, it 
frees up the licensing for them to get back into the field so they can up staffing. And he says that just within the past 24 hours, 180 people have taken advantage of that and are going to be getting back into the fields to help out with this outbreak. So with that, Brandis, back to you. All right, Amanda, good to know. Thank you. And still to come on Chicago tonight, how grocery stores are maintaining supplies amid pandemic panic buying. Half off Divi memberships and free rides for paratransit customers. How Chicago's transportation network is adapting to the coronavirus. What Illinois academic institutions are doing to move classes online. And one bakery's creative approach to wipe its shelves clean of cakes. But first, we check back in with Paris Schutz, who's on Devon Avenue on Chicago's north side. Earlier in the program, he reported on the impact of the coronavirus on that community and how small business owners are working against the pandemic. Now, Paris joins us again. Paris. So, Brandis, we mentioned in that last debrief that there's a lot of immigrants and refugees around Devon Avenue in the Rush Ridge neighborhood. So we wanted to talk about how the coronavirus and the shutdown is impacting those communities. And joining me is Angie Lobo of the India Indo-American Center. Your organization works with those communities, gets to, to work on citizenship, access to public benefits. So, so tell us how the coronavirus has impacted immigrants and refugees. Yes, um, I think that it's times of crisis when we really see the cracks in the social safety net impact folks who are already living on the edge or on the fringes really even more so um, struggle and have a hard time accessing benefits and the things that they need. So one of the biggest things that we've been worried about is all of the information, all of the notices that have been coming out have been coming out in English, of course. And frankly, most of the folks that we work with and in our community are not able to understand what's coming out. So we're spending a lot of time doing translations and really just helping with language access so that folks are even able to access resources that are available. And we're talking about dozens of different languages here. So what have some of these folks been telling you since the shutdown started on Saturday? Right. Well, so we have a seniors program that we work with, and the seniors, of course, have been scared and nervous. Uh, we're making sure that we're providing culturally appropriate services to them. We want to be delivering meals to seniors, but if they are uh, not familiar with the regular home delivery meals, we're trying to make sure that we can provide them culturally appropriate meals. It just is one more level of fear and worry that they're having to face. So what about people that are in the middle of the immigration process right now? How does this shutdown affect them? Yes, we're having a lot of questions about what it means for immigration status. We have folks that leave the, who are green card holders, who leave the country for the winter and who come back in the spring and over their, the immigration rules require that you are, if you're a green card holder, in order to stay uh, current, you are not allowed to be out of the country for more than 180 days. So folks are now afraid that they're not gonna be able to get back in the country and they don't know what to do about jeopardizing their status. We also have folks that are currently in the country on their visa and they're afraid that they're going to be overstaying their visa because they can't leave and they also don't know what to do. USCIS is not processing applications at this time. I think there's some online customs and immigration. Have they told you what they're going to do? I mean, if someone overstays their visa as a result of this shutdown, are they safe? We have heard mixed messages. We're a little bit crossing our fingers and hoping things are okay, but basically what people are telling us is we don't know yet. So you've spoken with some state and federal lawmakers. What have they told you about the answers to some of these questions? They, uh, we've sp spoken with federal lawmakers who have said that they're aware of the problems and they're trying to get answers for us. There are a lot of questions about what this all means to undocumented communities and also how undocumented uh, folks are able to access services, especially at the federal level. State lawmakers are being pretty good. There's more flexibility in uh, state funding, so they're being pretty helpful and trying to figure out a lot of workarounds, but there are just a lot of unknowns. You mentioned that one of the programs that your group offers is, is meals for seniors. Um, because people cannot congregate in groups now, it's kind of put a stop to that program. So how have these seniors in this program gotten their meals? Yes, so we had been 
still cooking the meals on our location and seniors were coming just picking up the meals and leaving as of today we've had to switch them to a home delivery vendor uh, an approved by the city home delivery vendor we were not yet an approved home delivery vendor so uh, we had to switch them to an entirely new vendor that is serving them meals that are not uh, culturally familiar to them uh, and delivered by people that maybe don't speak their language. So we're, we're a little nervous about what that will mean. The city's been trying to work with us in order to make that transition as smooth as possible. Uh, but the seniors are uncomfortable and nervous. All right, here's your logo. Good luck handling all of this. It's a, it's a lot to handle, I know, and we thank you for being out here in thank the cold you. with us. And thank you so practicing much. Practicing the social distancing. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Brandis, we're going to go right back to you. Paris, thank you. And up next, how are grocery stores keeping their supply up with demand? Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash daily briefing and sign up. Panic buying is being seen across the country due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Already, toilet paper and hand sanitizer have become precious commodities that are flying off the shelves just as soon as they're stocked. So how are grocery stores maintaining their supplies and will their supply chains hold up under the strain of the crisis? Joining us are Daniel Stanton, author of Supply Chain Management for Dummies. He's joining us from Charlotte, North Carolina. John Marikas, co-owner of Food Smart on Armitage Avenue in the Logan Square neighborhood, and Amanda Puck, spokesperson for Mariano's, who's joining us from their Ravenswood store. I should also mention she is the original and the former host of Check, Please. Welcome back, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you. <laughs> so, John, let's start with you, please. How are supply chains holding up for you? Uh, so far, so good. Yeah, it was the one last week where everybody was sort of hoarding, but nobody knew what was happening. Uh, it, it, em it actually emptied all the shelves. Uh, but this week, it's been a little slower since Saturday, and our suppliers are, most of them are coming through with full truck loads of groceries for us. Amanda Puck, how about you all? It's the same. We, you know, we do have plenty of food. We're working closely with all of our, our vendors. Um, we have a distribution center that's working around the clock to get the stores products and food. Um, and, you know, it has leveled off a little bit since, um, as John mentioned, but we, we do have plenty of food, especially produce, meat and seafood. I know you can see the produce department behind me and, you know, we are, we're, we are stocked. Uh, Daniel Stanton, are there any particular vulnerabilities in the supply chain? You know, right now, the supply chain for most of the things that we're talking about here in terms of food are working just fine. You know, supply chains are resilient and adaptable, but you know, the things that's changed is, you know, we, we may not be eating more food or using more toilet paper, but we're using it in different places, which means we're buying it in different places. And so it's just taking a little while for the supply chain to pivot and make sure that that stuff is being directed to grocery stores instead of restaurants and offices. But, but all of it is there, it's still being made. It just needs to sort of be rerouted and, and shift the channel that it gets to us. So all, all of us know, obviously, the, the hardest things that have been to get are the toilet paper and the hand sanitizer. Um, but what other items are you all experiencing a lot of demand for, Amanda? Um, we're, we are seeing demand for, for everything. I mean, and like I said, we have, you know, stock the produce department. Our meat and seafood service areas are well stocked, so customers can come in and um, purchase meat and seafood items. What we're also doing too is um, we're trying to uh, supply meal solutions to families, so we're pre-packing um, a lot of things that normally you know we would make in the store. So we have take and bake pizzas for people to take home, meal kits, um, meal solutions for customers. Um, we are light still in some areas on dairy, but all stores do have dairy and eggs and bread. Um, some items do have limits still because we are trying to prevent um, the hoarding and realize that we're all in this together. And, you know, when you're shopping, you know, to really get the things that you need. Um, and we are trying to offer uh, meal solutions for, for our shoppers and families. John, what have you all experienced? Um, many of the staples were wiped out immediately. So flour, peanut butter, rice, beans, uh, baking products. Those are the things that we didn't, we had our big inventory and everybody wiped us out. But now on our second, you know, we, are, we got a load in today. Most of the items are available now, even toilet paper. 
this, this is good to know now that you've said it. <laughs> Everybody's going to come to your store for the toilet we'll paper. We'll be right over. No, <laughs> um, so, Daniel, then, will suppliers be able to continue to meet demand in the coming weeks? Um, and how, you know, might that demand or how will their ability to do that be affected by whether or not people heed the advice of officials to not hoard and to just buy what they need? Well, the, for supply chain people, what we're seeing right now is a phenomenon that we call the bullwhip effect. And, and what happens with the bullwhip effect is when there's a significant change in demand, either an increase or a decrease, that change, um, it, it, it acts like a, a, a bullwhip. The impacts get amplified at each upstream step. So um, the, the grocery stores feel it, but their distributors feel it even more, and the manufacturers feel it even more. And what that tends to do is it creates this pattern of all of a sudden one of them is completely out of stock and the next step in the supply chain has a huge amount of excess inventory. That happens because there are delays, right? It, it, things don't get uh, manufactured instantaneously and it takes time for them to move through the supply chain and get where they need to go. If, if we can sort of limit the, the hoarding and the panic buying and just buy what we need, the supply chain can absolutely adapt and support it, but it just needs a little bit of time th for things to level out and reach steady state in order to get rid of that bullwhip. Should, uh, you know, are there hiccups down the line that have to be anticipated? For example, you know, as, as uh, COVID-19 should spread um, and more people are contracting it, is there a concern about workers, both in the grocery stores, but also in the supply chain uh, being impacted and slowing things down? I think that is absolutely a concern, right? So it's easy to say, well, we can, you know, make more toilet paper if the demand goes up, but we need people to do that. And so what could impact our supply and our capacity would be if a lot of people actually start getting sick and aren't able to, to work. Um, and, and while, you know, many of us can work from home, there are still a lot of people that need to go to the store, to the factory, to the distribution center, drive the truck. We need those people healthy. We need them working for the supply chains to operate. Um, there are also, there, you know, there are a lot of things, even in our food supply chain, that come from uh, sources abroad. Um, you know, if, if you look at the ingredients on a lot of packaged foods and you really understand where those things come from, they come from South America, Africa, Asia. So as um, countries start to either shut down exports or as uh, com or countries put up trade barriers to shut down imports, it could impact, you know, because we can't get some of the ingredients to make the products that we buy. So those are sort of my two longer term concerns about supply. Uh, Amanda, have you all noticed any changes in prices? Um, our prices have stayed the same. Um, we have, you know, special prices on some things and, and not on others, uh, but our pricing structure for the most part has stayed the same. Have you, have you noticed anything with regards to the prices that you all pay your suppliers? I, I have not noticed that. I don't, I don't think I can speak to that right now, but I have not noticed that. John, have you noticed anything? The only thing I haven't noticed it yet because it hasn't come yet, but my sub, some of my suppliers have told me that beef is going to take a little uh, raise in prices. I, I think trucking too. You know, right now there's actually a lot of demand for transportation and a limited capacity, and that's a market that's very fluid. So I, I think uh, the, the, the third-party logistics providers that, that run trucks, the, the prices in that market have been increasing. Okay. Um, John, how are your employees holding up? You own two stores uh, in the area, and how are you all working to keep them safe uh, as they're interacting with customers? Well, on Monday, we put up sneeze guards on all the checkouts. We have stations where you can wipe off your hands. We take, like, Clorox wipes and clean the shopping carts, the hard service counters, the door handles, uh, the cooler doors. Um, that's what we're trying to do right now. And I understand your wife and your daughters have been making masks for the staff. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. We just made some. We gave them all to all the employees. You know, anybody that wanted to wear one, just it's it's another way to try to protect everybody. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. My thanks to John Marikas, Amanda Puck, and Daniel Stanton. Thanks to all of you. Stay healthy. Thank, okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Big discounts on Divi memberships, no cuts to CTA service, free rides for paratransit customers. This morning, the city announced measures to make things easier for Chicagoans who still need to get around town.
As Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg reports, with many Chicagoans mostly staying home, the city's transportation landscape has changed drastically in a matter of days. Throughout the coronavirus pandemic, Mayor Lightfoot's been clear on one thing. We have to keep the public transit system going. People need to be able to get to work. Especially, Lightfoot says, health care workers, first responders, 911 dispatchers. In an announcement this morning, Lightfoot reiterated her commitment to regular CTA service. There's obviously concerns about workers who are operating the system as well as people who are, who are riding uh, our buses and trains. Uh, but I think that's overwhelmed by the need uh, for essential workers to get to health care um, to get to grocery stores. Even with no changes to service, the CTA's seen huge changes in ridership. The agency told Chicago Tonight it analyzed bus and rail passenger numbers from this past Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The preliminary numbers show about a 70% drop compared to the same three days last year. Tuesday, the CTA announced it's offering its customers credit for unused days on weekly and monthly passes. With many Chicagoans who don't drive looking for ways to get around other than the CTA, the city announced Tuesday that it's going to make it cheaper to access its bike share network. Through the end of April, annual Divi memberships are $50, half the normal price. 30-minute rides are a dollar instead of the usual $3, and healthcare workers can get a free month of 45-minute bike trips. With previous pricing, I think people would have looked at it in terms of like, well, Divi's more expensive than me taking the train or the bus, even though the train or bus is more risky in terms of exposure. But I have to think about my budget, especially um, as people's incomes are impacted by this. So I think it's a great move. Even without those incentives, the Divi system's already seen ridership spike. Between March 1st and March 19th, the city's transportation department counted more than 114,000 Divi trips, 23,000 more than the same time period in 2019. Pace also announced it's offering free rides for paratransit customers up to $30, and the city says it's working on subsidies and halting tax collections for taxi and rideshare drivers. The unprecedented upheaval right now means transit agencies are going to be in a budget crunch. The Active Transportation Alliance has been pushing for stimulus programs to include public transit. We're in a situation where our state and our federal government are have already been uh, underfunding mass transit for so long, uh, so the financial position of CTA, Metro, and PACE was already um, so uh, fragile, and, and it's gotten so much worse. Whitehead says in addition to propping up agencies, protecting transit workers and passengers is also key. The University of Illinois at Chicago's Kate Lowe agrees. She said today's announcement was a great start, but hopes to see the CTA eliminate front door bus boarding and fare collection as long as passengers are physically able to board through the rear door. New York City has adopted this, Houston, Detroit. So it was missing what I see as a really important near term. Uh, intervention that is a blunt instrument by waiving fares for bus riders, but a somewhat progressive one. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. And we have more information on all the initiatives we mentioned on our website. And later this week, Nick will take a look at what lessons Chicago might learn from how other cities are adapting their transit networks. Up next, a look at how local colleges and universities are adapting to the need for teaching remotely. Like many of us during this COVID-19 pandemic, the nation's academic institutions are learning as they go. Shifting operations online while instructing students at their homes all over the country and even the world. So how are Illinois colleges and universities managing the switch? Joining us to talk about how their institutions are faring are John Gernack, director of the Office of Online Learning at Loyola University Chicago, Randy Picker, the James Parker Hall Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago, and Jason Rohde, Executive Director of Extended Learning at Northern Illinois University. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, so first, John Gernack, let's start with you, please. What has your institution done to make the switch? 
Well, our, our efforts over the past several years by Loyola's faculty to prepare and deepen their skills for delivering remote curriculum um, have put us in a pretty good place in terms of um, being, a, being prepared for this global health crisis. Um, we are managing the shift by leveraging our resources to best support our faculty and students in the transition to remote instruction. Um, now, I call it remote instruction because although it is online, much of it has not been deliberately designed for online delivery as most online programs and courses are. So we're adapting to our current circumstances. Thankfully, we have a talented team of support personnel and creative faculty that have allowed us to quickly shift to this new course delivery method. Uh, Jason Rohde, how about you? Where would you say you all are in the, in the transition? Well, our goal at Northern Illinois University is always to help our students succeed every day, and the pandemic really hasn't changed that. Uh, we have had to quickly pivot to a remote learning model, as was previously mentioned, uh, to ensure that students continue to get a high quality education. So in fact, this past week, we extended our spring break by one week to provide our faculty the opportunity to retool the delivery of their instruction, as well as for us to work with our student support services to ensure that we were ready to move to a fully virtual uh, student delivery model. And uh, just yesterday was our first day of being uh, fully virtual in our delivery of our instruction, uh, moving into this uh, remote learning uh, mode of delivery. How would you say uh, faculty and instructors are being prepared for this or have been prepared for this? So over the last week, uh, we have spent really, uh, we've conducted about four months worth of training in just a week uh, where we have uh, offered over 30 workshops for faculty. Uh, we've had over 900 uh, participants at those virtual sessions. We've had uh, individual consultations where we've worked one-on-one -on -one with faculty either over by the phone or virtually, uh, really to talk about best practices, to uh, give them ideas for how they can use the available technologies um, to make that pivot. And thus far, we've had uh, great success and, and very positive feedback thus far from our faculty and our students. Randy Picker, how is, as a professor, you know, how is teaching uh, from a distance so different from teaching in person? Well, it's a question of which way you're going to do it. So uh, as the buzzwords go, you have asynchronous and synchronous. Uh, asynchronous is, is when I create videos. I have an online course. You can binge watch me this weekend if you want. Um, and tens of thousands of people have done that. That's not our plan next Monday. Our plan next Monday is to come as close as possible as to recreating the in-person University of Chicago experience. That's synchronous learning. That means I'm gonna call on students just like I do. That's the Socratic method. I'm gonna ask them if they've read the material. They're gonna say they have, and then we're gonna have a conversation. Does the technology ever slow you down in that process? Uh, my goal here is, is to make this technology like electricity, absolutely essential, but you only notice it when it's not working. My job is to make it work. My goal, private goal this week was to do seven Zoom calls. I think I'll double that. I'm getting better and better each call. I think we're all getting better at the Zoom calls. Uh, <laughs> how would you say, uh, what about grading and assessing? Are you still able to, to get a good sense of, of whether or not your students are, are learning the material? You know, I think I'm gonna have lots of ways of doing that. So, um, you know, I think actually the chat window will be interesting. So I'm gonna have students sort of create questions during class. And then after the class is over, we'll go into a separate online room and talk those through. Um, I answer questions right after class in a physical cl classroom, and I intend to do exactly the same thing in a virtual classroom. So um, uh, this technology seems really good. I'm, uh, you know, look, it's a terrible time, but I think we're gonna deliver high quality education through this medium. John Gernack, how would you say this is gonna, going to affect seniors? Or are they still going to be able to achieve all the things they need to get done in order to graduate? Yeah, I would, I would say so. I think the university um, has made that a, a priority, uh, making sure our students have a way to continue their semester and stay on track to graduation is really priority number one for us. Uh, we feel it's really valuable to offer a small amount of certainty in an uncertain world at this time, so. Uh, and this could be a question really for all of you. You know, could this be a model for the future? Have, have major universities been slow to start leveraging technology um, to use it for more and more online learning, to make it more accessible? So I think it's interesting. I've had students do my online course, people who loved it, 
they come to the university because of it. And then they say, oh, being in the classroom with you is so much better. That's not about me. I'm fine. It's about the interaction. Now, I think this is going to be an interesting intermediate spot. And honestly, what I'm excited about this is, is how we can stay in touch with our alums down the road. They aren't all going to stay in Chicago, but we'd like to engage with them intellectually. I think we'll be able to do that through this medium. So I think students will still come to Chicago and Hyde Park for, you know, three or four years. But we're going to be able to stay in touch with them in a really powerful intellectual way after through this technology once we're beyond the crisis, I hope. Jason Rohde, what about you? I'd say, you know, as we're striving to create this robust learning experience, uh, this experience over these next number of weeks is not the same as what we'd call a fully developed online course, but certainly it's going to raise visibility and awareness and an understanding of the potential of these, this technology. And I think opens the door for faculty and students to perhaps consider um, other opportunities in the future that are maybe more technology mediated, like we're seeing in these uh, remote learning uh, types of environments right now. John Gernack, what would you say about uh, inequities in, in access to uh, the internet and this kind of technology? How is that being managed? Well, the university has, has made a deliberate effort to basically survey our students and our faculty to understand what technology tools they have available to them and uh, basically reach, reach out to those that maybe need specific equipment or internet connections and help them to, uh, to handle that, um, that challenge or overcome that challenge. A good portion of our faculty at Loyola already have extensive experience and familiarity with online teaching. So uh, them transitioning to this remote teaching environment, um, it has been a challenge for some faculty, but we have a good system, a support system in place through, um, through our support personnel, as well as faculty mentoring um, that has, has made the transition a lot easier. And of course, you know, students are paying tuition uh, for the learning that they're receiving. Has, for any of you, are the universities discussing any sort of uh, refund or credit, or how's that going to be applied for these students? Well, students at NIU are going to continue to receive instruction that counts toward a degree, and so we don't plan to make any changes to tuition. Um, however, there will be adjustments to things such as student fees and housing and dining costs, and we'll be addressing those as we move forward. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. My thanks to John Gernack, Jason Rohde, and Randall, Randy Picker. Thanks, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And up next, how one local bakery is rolling with the changes caused by the coronavirus. Stick around. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. Since Governor Pritzker ordered Illinois restaurants to close, small business owners have been searching for ways to make money. Our WTTW news reporter Patty Wetley has been tracking some of those methods and she joins us now to tell us about one bakery's creative approach. Hey there, Patty. Hi, Brandis. Good so, to hear you. <laughs> good to hear you as well. Uh, I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. But I know. What is one bakery doing to sell its cakes? So Naomi Levine, who is the owner of Tipsy Space, which is actually a bakery slash event space, she has come up with uh, the most expensive roll of toilet paper. It's $50, but it's uh, actually um, quite a magnificent cake in the shape of one of those, you know, elusive rolls of toilet paper. So she's selling those for two different sizes. Small roll is like 50 bucks and a large roll that would feed 10 to 12 people um, is $100. And that is the kind of toilet paper you definitely want to uh, hoard. <laughs> uh, so this bakery has been doing it to make money. How, how, have, how is she, how have they been impacted by uh, the COVID-19 measures? Well, she, it's a brand, Tipsy Space is only seven months old. So they only had a few months under their belt um, as a business. And it's, it's an event space. And so she had to refund all of um, the money deposits to people who were planning events and nobody is scheduling them. Obviously, nobody knows what the future is gonna hold. So that's a huge hit to a new business. Uh, so she was kind of immediately scrambling uh, for ways to kind of keep things going, keep customers, uh, gain customers. You're still in the process of building a business in seven months. So yeah, she came up with this idea for the cake maybe hoping to cut through some clutter with a really cool uh, image. 
um, and is also serving isolation meals that people can order off her website and either pick up or will be delivered. Well, a lot of a lot of need to go around. It sounds like Patty. Thank you yes, so much for joining is. us. Thanks. And you can read Patty's complete story on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. While you're there, make sure to check out our interview with Check Please host Alpina Singh. She talks about how other restaurants are coping with economic pressures amidst the pandemic. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and of course our website, wttw.com slash news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.